Well, good evening, folks. It's good to uh, see you out this evening. If you're joining us online, I'm glad that you can uh, join with us. We're uh, having Mark Armstrong, one of our own uh, missionary family, uh, sharing about the work of Langham and bringing us an update on the work that he's involved in and will be involved in, and uh, also bringing us a short devotion from God's Word. So we're looking forward uh, to what Mark has to share with us. We're going to begin our service. We're going to sing. Uh, hopefully the words will be on the screen. Uh, above me all heal the power of Jesus' name. Let's stand and let's sing together as we begin our service. confess this evening that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, that he is the one who is worthy of our praise and he is worthy of our worship and our honor. Father, we meet in this building because of what he has done for us. Father, we meet here because the grace that you have shown uh, through him and the grace that has reached our hearts and our lives, Father, has changed us and transformed us. Father, we praise you for that miracle uh, that has been wrought in each one of our hearts here uh, when we trusted in you, Lord, and we uh, pray and thank you, Father, that you have given us the gift of your, your spirit in our hearts, teaching us to say uh, no to sin and yes to righteousness, Father. And we thank you that you've also given us the task to uh, make Christ known where he is not known, uh, to share the gospel uh, in every part of our lives, Father, with everyone whom we come in contact with in all our context, Father, we do pray and ask for help in that regard, Lord. We do pray and thank you that you continue to give us help with all of those uh, endeavors and as we seek to, to, to serve you and to worship you in that way, Father. We thank you for Mark and Lorraine. and we thank you for the work that Mark has been particularly involved in with Langham, Father. We pray that you would uh, continue to bless him, continue to bless them together, Father, continue to bless the work that he's involved with, Father, we, as we, he comes to share now. Uh, may you give him that uh, strength and liberty as he steps into the pulpit, as we hear and learn about what you are doing, Father, we pray that you would uh, continue to speak to us, Father, continue to use us, uh, drive us to your throne in prayer, Father, to look to you as the, the giver of all good gifts. Father, bless our time now. And as we come to prayer in a short while, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
going to hand over to Mark now. Thank you, Chris. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, really lovely to be here. Um, I spend a lot of my time in a lot of different churches, but it's certainly good to be in my home church this evening and able to give you an update on the work in which we are involved in. Um, you will, there's a stand out there. It's mainly Langham Partnership uh, uh, material, but please uh, feel free to take a look, take a look at it. Everything but the books are free. Don't take the books away on, on me. But uh, there's a few things that I want to emphasize just before we, we uh, spend some time in God's Word. Um, there is a number of these cards here, uh, Langham Partnership, these little cards. These are discount cards that whenever you go on to the Langham website, and it's giving you 40% off uh, the Langham books um, with free... Uh, Free, free something, free shipping. Um, but I see that the it's only valid until the 31st of March, so you need to get your skates on if you want to feel that, feel of that. Also, there's some of these little information cards um, that if you want to know more about the work which we are involved in, please fill that in. Uh, we have a Langham magazine here. It's called Transform. This is the old magazine. The next one is due out in about two weeks' time. So if it had been here two weeks later, you would have had the latest magazine, so that's there. But I also just, one other thing, there's little Z cards. If you don't know what Langham is, they, those are out there as well. Take those. But I want to focus on this book here by Rico Valenbella. Val um, Rico uh, is a Langham scholar. Um, he uh, did a PhD and did a, did a PhD on the Lament Psalms. And as a result of doing his PhD, he wrote this book here, which is called It's Okay Not to Be Okay. And uh, what Rico really focuses on is that we have these wonderful worship songs that say God is good all the time, all the time God is good. And that's great to sing those whenever the wind is blowing in our backs. But what happens whenever tragedy hits our lives? What happens whenever difficult times hits our lives? What happens whenever we really ask question, what God, uh, God, what are you doing and why are you doing it? Well, that's what he looks at in this book here. Uh, it's okay not to be okay. So again, you can obtain that from the, from the Langham website. If you've got your Bibles with you, perhaps you would like to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, where we will just spend a few moments in the first three verses uh, before I... I progress to tell you what we've been getting up to. What I really want to focus on this evening is not only telling you what we're doing it, what we're doing, but, but also to inform you why we're doing it. Just not what we're doing, but why we're doing it. So Ephesians chapter 4, uh, just the first three verses. Paul writes this, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And we know that God always blesses the public reading of His holy, inspired, and infallible Word as we have it in our own native language. In the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul has been teaching biblical doctrine to the church at Ephesus, where his desire has been to bed in theological truths into the minds as well as the hearts of the Ephesians, so that they would obtain uh, knowledge of, of the truth, so that they would gain confidence in Christ, in the Christ in whom they said, that they have believed. However, as you come to chapter 4, chapter 4 is really a turning point where Paul moves from doctrine to duty, from theology to practicality, from exposition to exhortation, where he now explains how the theology they have learned relates to their lives as they, as they would go about their daily business in Ephesus. This is clearly seen in verse 1 where Paul calls the local church 
to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And Paul's command to this church was that they were to be on this constant journey of displaying through their lives what they were in Jesus Christ. The theological foundation that that they had been taught in chapters 1 to 3 was to be evidenced in how they conducted their lives. Yes, they were to spend time in studying God's Word and spend time in the Scriptures, getting to know the depths of the love of Christ for them. But the knowledge of Christ's love for them needed to have an outlet where they needed to live lives that were worthy of the privilege in which they had to be called Christians, Christ ones, ones belonging to Christ. And that's what this word worthy really means in verse 1. Because the word worthy in the original language refers to being of equal weight or keeping in balance. The balance of getting to know Christ on one side, but on the other side there was the balance of the requirement to show Christ in the environment in which they were living. Where they were to know about Christ, that was to be equaled out with how they reacted to the situations in which they faced in life. To help this church to think about the balance between knowing Christ and showing Christ, Paul in verse 2 gives some examples in how their knowledge of Christ was to be displayed in their lives, where they were to be completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing one another in love, They were to be peaceable where they were to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bonds of peace. Basically speaking, Paul's instruction to this church and through the Holy Spirit to us this evening is that there is this need to maintain this balance between what we know about Christ and how we show Christ. Yes, we have to know Christ but we must show Christ. We must show Christ to each other as well as to this world that doesn't know Christ. Whenever there's an imbalance between knowing Christ and showing Christ, it really distorts the world's view of who Jesus is. An imbalance brings the name of Jesus into disrepute. Because if we simply know Christ, but we don't show Christ, the danger is that our Christianity becomes nothing more than a metaphysical exercise, where the Bible becomes nothing more than a dry book of theory that needs to somehow be mastered, but it really has no implication to our lives. Where on the way to mastering the knowledge of the Bible, there's the danger of developing a hypercritical attitude where we just start to dance on theological pins. But on the other hand, when we show Christ without knowing Christ, it opens the way to embracing all kinds of heresy, where we embrace every wind of biblical teaching because simply we don't know any better. So there's the need in the church. There's the need for you and me to know Christ, but that must be balanced with showing Christ. And what I'm going to show you now over the next few minutes is the danger whenever this imbalance really enters into the church and the devastating damage in which it can actually cause. Because in the world, 174,000 people come to faith in Jesus Christ every single day. That's that's 63.5 million people come to faith in Jesus every single day. Roughly, roughly, the population of the UK is coming to faith in Jesus Christ every year. Out of that, 67% of new conversions happen in the majority world. 42.5 million people come to faith in Christ in the majority world. 
Now, that majority world might be a relatively new term to you. It's a relatively new term to missionology. But whenever we talk about the majority world within, within mission terms, what we're referring to is any nation where the local church is not taking the lead. So any nation where the church is not self-sufficient by its own indigenous people, we can refer to that as the majority world, especially in three areas. In evangelism, in other words, the local church, if a local church within a nation needs people from the outside to come in to that nation and to teach the truths of the gospel, well then that nation is part of the majority world. Or if the church within that nation needs people to come in from the outside to be involved in discipleship, that is nurturing and building up people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ, we can class that nation as part of the majority world. Or if a, if a church within a nation needs people from the outside to come in to that nation to train future, uh, uh, to train future uh, uh, church leaders, well, that nation is part of the majority world. So really we're talking about Africa, Latin America, South America, big parts of Asia, as well as a few other countries are part of this majority world. And 67% of all conversions happen within these nations. Well, whenever somebody comes to faith in Christ, especially within the majority world, within this, this 42.5 million people, well, our desire is that they will get bedded into the Word of God, that they will be um, 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 developed from, from being on the milk onto, onto the meat of the Word, that they would create uh, foundational truths, uh, they will be taught foundational truths from God's Word. That's the desire. However, whenever there is no training, and we have these people coming to faith in Jesus Christ, yet there's no training, it actually causes a vacuum. And into that vacuum, there comes all the heretical teachings that there is. Of course, the main one that you might think of is prosperity gospel, but there's many, many others. There's syncretism, word of faith movement, um, and uh, material heresy, and all sorts of different heresies. And those heretical teaching gets a foothold within the local church, because people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, but there's no teaching. And this causes the, that, that vacuum. So what's the result of there being no biblical foundation within these churches? Well, what's the effect on the church leaders of these churches in the majority world where they, don't, where they have not had this uh, foundational teaching within the Word of God? Well, First of all, 80% of pastors have no training. That's actually quite a, it's quite a, 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 a reserved estimate. Uh, the Lausanne movement would say that that figure is actually as high as 95% of all pastors, if you like, within Africa, Asia, um, Latin America, South America, have not had any theological training at all. One in four of these pastors preach without any preparation. Now, I don't call myself a preacher. I never will call myself a preacher. However, somebody just happens to preach. I think there's a world of difference between the two. But um, you get to the point whenever you're preaching, if somebody sort of lands on you, you could get up and you could share a word. But you certainly couldn't do that week in and week out. But one in four preach without any preparation. Want to use a Northern Ireland term? They just wing it week in, week out. And only 18% preach in context. Only 18% will preach through a book or a character or whatever through Scripture. The most of them will just pull a verse or part of a verse and they will preach for a couple of hours on that. And into that there comes heresy and heretical teaching simply because they don't have any biblical foundation. So what's the consequences on new believers? 
Well, of course, if their pastors and their Bible teachers have no biblical foundation, well, they themselves are unable to identify uh, heretical teaching. They are blown by every wind that comes into the situation. As a matter of fact, most of them will get their theology through the TV and through different TV programs that will, that will be um, um, uh, shown to them uh, in their homes. That's how they obtain their, their, their theological understanding. Secondly, that then creates spiritual immaturity. They never get past the milk onto the meat, which in turn results in they have a lack of biblical confidence. How they, they have no confidence in whom they believe. They have no confidence that Jesus Christ is the only way. They have no confidence that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They have no confidence in that. And if they have no confidence, well, how then are they going to disciple others? And that's the result of having no uh, biblical foundation within um, these majority world nations. And that affects 67% of Christians tonight on the 22nd of March, 2022. As a matter, that, matter of fact, that figure, 67%, will rise to 77% within the next 20 years. I wonder how that makes you feel. I wonder how that makes you feel sitting in the comfort of this church under sound teaching, comfort, that 67% of your brothers and sisters in Christ have no theological foundation and they're not being taught the word of God and they're not being built up in their faith. I wonder how that makes you feel. Well, that's what, this is what the real need then is. And the need is to develop Bible-saturated church leaders in the majority world who through their preaching and lives will feed the local church so she is the image of Christ within our context. That is the number one need in the majority world tonight. And that's what Lorraine and I are involved in and uh, spend our time doing. And we do it through two organizations. Uh, 30, between 30 and 35 hours of my week is spent with this organization here called Learn Global. As you know, most of you know as much about Learn Global as probably as I do. Of course, Learn stands for Leaders Equipping and Resourcing Network. And we see that our, our mission statement is to resource and equip Christian leaders to be effective communicators of the gospel. That is our desire through it. Um, I've sort of thought many times that I have stood up here a number of times and given reports, and I've never told you actually what I do as part of it, so I thought I would do that this evening. My official role is a development officer for them, um, and I report directly to the board of trustees. And I have a, a number of roles. First of all, I'm a first contact for potential partners so every week, I'll get a phone call or I'll get an email from someone saying that we would like to become a partner with Learn Global. And uh, we, it's my job to start to investigate that to see if that's going to progress to fruition. I also have the responsibility of writing, uh, that's called documents of intent, and agreements and memorandums of, of understanding for partners. That's really where we obtain a, a partner and we're going to work with a partner where there has to be agreements set out. And I would write those agreements between Learn Global and, and the partner, whoever that partner is going to be. I also have the responsibility for researching resources or researching books. Uh, just yesterday I signed a, a, an agreement, a license with the Good Book Company. Um, the day before that I signed an agreement with uh, for the, with the Good Book Company for 25 books. Just the day before that, I signed an agreement with uh, Crossway for the ESV Bible and the ESV Global Bible. And these are sorts of things I'm sort of negotiating with publishers regarding getting resources and uh, getting the licensing all sorted out for that. And uh, I also negotiate copyright licenses with publishers. 
Of course, publishers will not give you their resources, not unless you can guarantee you that nobody's going to uh, steal their work. And uh, so I negotiate the copyright licenses with 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 uh, the different pub with different publishers, and that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to do that. I'm also involved in ordering, ordering the hardware from suppliers. That's the tablets and stuff like that. There, I I'm in direct contact with our suppliers uh, all over the world, really, um, ordering there. Uh, and whenever we get the tablets in, the end they then have to be loaded with the Learn Global um, apps, and uh, I'm involved in that. And then uh, it's my job then to get them away to whatever nation. I've had a couple of sleepless nights over the last few nights. I sent a 50 tablets to Zimbabwe, and they went missing. <laughs> and uh, that was a sort of a end up the, the our transport company sent them to the wrong address for some unknown reason. Um, but uh, that was a sort of a, an interesting few days trying to work out where they were. Um, of course, then I do presentations to churches. So I am more, involved, more or less involved in the, in the logistics. We have people who are involved in the, in the technical side. Of, I'm not technical in any, in any way. Um, this is my limit tonight, pressing a button. But, um, but we have people who are involved in the technical side of it and, and the actual developing and designing and of, the, of, the, of the technology. Whenever we talk about the Learn app, you probably think about one app, but actually there's 10 different Learn apps that has been developed. I'm not going to start and go through all of them for you because I don't know whether I confuse you, but I'll just confuse myself even trying to explain what all those do. But all those apps are all needed to make the Learn software work, and all those have been designed from scratch. I was talking to our web, our, our, our designer, he told me just the couple of weeks ago that it's roughly about 400,000 lines of code, which doesn't mean a certain lot, maybe to a lot of it, but there's 400,000 lines of code that makes the whole thing work. Um, and every one of those lines of code have been, have been written individually by our, our designer, and we certainly thank God for him. Um, and really what we look to do is to create a study in the palm of their hand. What we looked is to get a, into the pastor's hand a, a, an apparatus in which they are able to, uh, to, to use, to study, to build up their own faith, so in turn that they can teach God's Word accurately and confidently to those whom God has given them. And really, all those different apps do these, uh, are all designed to do these different tasks. First of all, it has multiple Bible translations. The app will work in numerous languages. Uh, we, were, we were just testing regarding a project that we're doing. Uh, we're testing it in Arabic and Farsi at the minute. And uh, so it'll work in multiple translations. Uh, it, it will, it's a, it's a, what's the word he uses for it? It's an interactive Bible, he, our designer calls it where you can highlight, you can make notes and do all sorts of things, so it does that for them. It also has books and resources. Um, the Zimbabwe project, I think, has about 60 books they have now. Um, also Bible dictionaries and concordances, numerous Bible dictionaries and concordances on it. Uh, it has reading plans on it. And I know I've said this before, but whenever you have a pastor who's not been used to reading um, uh, you actually have to teach them how to read systematically, and that's what that reading plan actually does. It reads, they read, it helps them to read systematically through a book, actually through the Bible as well. So that's what those reading plans is for. They're also to be able to write their sermons on it and uh, um, and uh, preach from it. Just as like somebody would preach from an iPad here, they can do that as well. Uh, they can note make notes and record and save and all the rest of that. And this is really one of the really exciting things that's happened over this last three months. We've developed what we call, what we call the Learn Narrator. Do you know that a third of the world can't read the language they speak? And another third of the world does not learn through reading. Now, 
whenever that gets into my mind, that just blows my mind. And these, especially, for example, in the nation of Paraguay, how do they do church? Because so much of our services involve reading. How do they do church? But a third of the world does not read the language they speak. And therefore, we've de- we designed what we call the, the Learn the Reader, where it reads it to them. It will read the books to them in their home language. It will read the Bible to them in their home language. But not only does it read it to them, but it highlights each word as it reads to them. And that's really for the education. I think that's called word identification or something they call that, so that they can start to identify words as they hear those words. And that just went live two months ago, and it's really been a blessing, and uh, we're really excited, excited about that happening. And I'm going to show you in a few moments exactly how that is working out in a nation. The technology also allows us to provide help support. If they ask a question, we can respond to them, the whole, as well as it creates uh, mentoring. If, if somebody needs mentored in a certain area, we can do that through this whole system. It all works independent of the internet. You don't need to be on the internet for it to work. However, whenever they do go onto the internet, and we ask them to do it one day in a month, whenever they do that, it will download uh, they're able to download more books, more resources, and at the same time, it informs us exactly how they're doing. So there's this, creates this relationship between ourselves and these, and these pastors. That's what the Learn app really does. So where are we working? Of course, you probably identify with me with Zimbabwe. At the minute, we have 524 pastors who has one of these tablets in Zimbabwe. Tomorrow, another 50 pastors will get, to get it in Zimbabwe in Mashonaland North. Um, and we're working there with two partners, SIM, serving in mission. And some of you might remember Walter Matamusa being here. Once you meet Walter, you'll never forget him um, being here with me. And uh, so Walter is the manager in SIM. And we're also working with another organization called SACPAY that I'll talk about in a, in a few moments. We're also piloting, and we just started piloting in January in Uganda, and we're working with Christianity Explored there. Christianity Explored, Rico Tice, um, uh, Christianity Explored, Life Explored, Discipleship Explored, all that uh, um, organization. We're working with them in Uganda, and we're running a pilot at the minute in there um, with 15 pastors. Uh, we are hoping later on in the springtime to be moving into Zambia uh, to work with SACP. And SACP stands for Southern Africa Church Planting Initiative. And SACP is really part of the Fellowship of Evangelical Churches in America. And they are working, uh, they are working with us. They are looking to work in six different nations over the next two years in Southern Africa, doing three nations this year, three nations next year. So and later in the springtime, we're, we're going to be in Zambia. And then by the summertime, working with SACP again, we're going to be in, in Malawi. Uh, in the summer, we're going to be working in Paraguay. Uh, Paraguay is one of the nations in which I just mentioned that they, they don't read the language they speak. And we're going to be piloting another app there. It's called the Learn Outreach app. And really, it's an app on which they will have on their phone. And um, this, is, this is designed for multiple use. It, we have a design that it can reach up to half a million people, and uh, where they will be able to get God's Word and listen to God's Word, as well as to interact with us um, uh, through that. And we're hoping to pilot that in, in the summer with, with SIM Paraguay. Um, and we're all wor- also working by the end of the year in seven security-sensitive nations. Um, and uh, obviously, I'll not say much more, much more about that. But it has meant that we have had to look at our whole system and the security of the whole network and what we do. And there's been quite a lot of work done just bedding that down so it is, it is secure that it, that it is safe. So just pray as we work and go into those nations. 
So that's what I spend three days, 30 to 36 hours a week doing, um, working around that. But I also spend two days a week, or fif officially 15 hours a week, um, working for this organization called Langham Partnership. Um, most of you will know that up until August of this year, uh, in order to supplement our support, I was working for Tesco's two days a week. Working for Tesco's is okay, but it wasn't me. <laughs> this wasn't me. So, uh, but Langham came and made an approach to me and said to me, listen, if you give us the hours which you work for, for um, Tesco's, would you come and work with us? So it took about two nanoseconds to say yes to that. And as you see, Langham Partnership's uh, motto or their mission statement is, uh, is that they're equipping the next generation of Bible teachers, very close actually to what Learn Global's is, uh, where, which Learn Global is equipping and resourcing um, um, church leaders to be effective communicators of the gospel. So the both models are actually quite close. So whenever you think about Langham Partnership, um, you can't get past this man, John Stott. John Stott was the, was the rector of All Souls Langham Place from 1950 to 1975. And in the late 1950s and into the 1960s, John started to develop a, a world preaching ministry where he went all throughout the world. And what I was sharing with you at the start about the majority world, John Stott saw that in the late 1950s happening. And as a result of that, and he started to, of, co of course, write books, but he started what we know today as Langham Partnership. And he developed what, what he called Langham Lo the, the, the Langham Logic. And Langham Logic is that God wants his church to grow up in maturity, not just in numbers. The church grows through God's word, and the Word of God comes to people primarily through preaching. And out of that Langham logic there has been developed what we call today is Langham Partnership. Where Langham Partnership is really just is one mission with three ministries. First of all, there is Langham Scholar, or the Langham Scholars. And what the Langham Scholars does, it takes uh, individuals from these majority world nations and it'll bring them either to the UK or to South Africa or to the USA, and they will invest in them heavily where these individuals will study to reach, uh, to get a PhD. And whenever they get a PhD, they then sign an agreement to go back into their home nation for the minimum of 10 years to be involved in teaching God's word to the next generation of, of church leaders. And we see there that um, the, we, at this time we have 325 trained PhD students still alive. This was started in 1969, still alive. Um, but they, have, uh, they are working all, all over the world, as we see. Um, I think they're working in, in 95 countries, I think, is what I think in my head. And we see that presently we align them is investing in 85 students who are presently studying. Students like, like Beatrice Ang. Uh, I just love Beatrice. Um, Beatrice Ang is a, is a Filipino, and uh, she came to Edinburgh to study, and she is studying in uh, her thesis title was John Christendom in the 4th century and how his style of leadership impacts the contemporary church. So I have trouble even saying it, never mind understanding what it means. But, uh, but um, Beatrice has just gained her PhD, and this summer she will go back to her home nation of the Philippines where she will teach in two Bible colleges in, um, in the Philippines. And what we, part of the statistics in which we have looked at is that a scholar who has a PhD will teach 7,787 more future leaders, church leaders, than if they didn't have a PhD over a 30-year period. So we see here that uh, Langham Scholarship 
is really impacting in, in theological excellence. Secondly, there is Langham preaching. And Langham preaching um, takes local preachers and they spend time and they go through three different seminars and it's really to train them how to exegete passages and how to preach God's Word. But not only just how to preach God's Word, but how to live their lives in, in, accordance, to, in accordance to God's Word. And we see there that there's one thousand last year there was 1,189 preaching clubs or these seminars happening in 85 countries where over 8,000 pastors were participating in that, and that was, that was during COVID. The third um, area in which Langham works is the one that's probably close to my heart, which is Langham Literature. And uh, we have produced, Langham has produced over a million books. As a matter of fact, all of John Stott's royalties goes to fund Langham, Langham Literature. And um, we see that those books are distributed in 135 different countries in the world. And you will see some of the books out there, especially uh, three one-volume com commentaries for different parts of the world. You will see them sitting out there. Just recently, Langham won an award for a book. I, it's not out there. It's called Living Radical Discipleship. And um, we don't say that because, hey, are we the boys winning, winning awards? But it actually shows the standards of Langham's, Langham literature that it's winning international awards. So, um, as I say, this here, go onto the website and you'll be able to view some of the, or view all the resources that is happening out, uh, that is happening out there. So, very quickly, time's away. Uh, what's my role? What do I do for, for, for Langham? Well, basically I maintain uh, existing relationships with supporters and trusts and churches, and as well as developing new relationships. Uh, I organize Langham events in Ireland. Um, I'm in the middle of a lot of events coming up this incoming weekend, as well as um, developing a prayer network uh, in the UK. Um, very quickly, as I close, uh, prayer points. We desperately need IT support when it comes to Learn Global. Um, it's the number one prayer need at the minute. And that uh, we are actually training a Zimbabwean who lives in Hungary at the minute. And uh, we certainly need more people who are IT proficient. We also need an ad hoc data assistant. That's just, if you have been involved in data inputting into a system, um, that's basically what we need. And uh, somebody just to help us the odd time is that. The F word, finance, is always an issue. Customs and excise, we are having some issues around getting paying customs and excise in the different nations of which we're going into, um, especially um, as a result of COVID. And the last one is really personally me, time management. <laughs> is uh, I, very busy doing very many things. And uh, at the end of the day, my, my dear old mother would say, if, if Satan can't rust you out, he'll burn you out. And I don't particularly want to do either. Um, so just appreciate the time management. Uh, regarding from the Langham perspective, the three, the three ministries, or the three programs, literature, preaching, and scholar. As I said, I have quite a busy weekend coming up. Um, Reverend Dr. Chris Wright, some of you may know him or know of him. Uh, he flies into Northern Ireland on Saturday and we're doing an event in Lisbon on Saturday afternoon. He's in Hamilton Road Presbyterian Church on Sunday, so I'll be there. Um, um, and then on Monday, which I guess would be of interest to us, he is lecturing most of the day in Irish Baptist College. Tuesday, we're going to Dublin to the Irish Bible Institute to, for him to lecture there. Wednesday, we're back up in Northern Ireland where he's lecturing in the Belfast Bible College. He gets on a plane at 3 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon to fly to Cambridge, to lecture in Cambridge on Wednesday night. And the man is about 74 years of age. And I, I can't keep up with him. So we certainly appreciate those areas of, of, um, for prayer. And as I finish, I want to thank you, and if I hadn't already done before, for your prayers um, and for your um, concern for us. Um, most of you will know I'm, I'm not very good at this talk. I'm not very good at walking up and talking to people. 
Um, but if you come and talk to me, I'll talk away to you. So um, uh, my mother calls me odd, however, maybe I'm odd. But um, certainly, if you want to have a conversation with me regarding these things, I'm more than happy to do that. Where's Chris? Good man. Thanks, Chris.